succeed. So right now we have uh, researchers and professors and staff and students researching groundbreaking projects here at Purdue, from studying how to bring cleaner water to African villages, to pioneering a program that will establish societies on other planets. However, the gender gap in engineering and in all STEM fields still remains. Uh, women make up our greatest untapped uh, talent pool, and that's something those of us at Purdue uh, really value, and we are trying to change. So I believe one of the best ways to actually make this change is by leadership in action and leadership through example. And Purdue Civil Engineering alumna Martha Rees is a wonderful person for all engineers uh, to look up to. Uh, so Martha started her career in 1973 as an environmental engineer at DuPont, where she focused her research on improving wastewater treatment processes with DuPont products. She then moved to manufacturing, where her concentration shifted to plant environmental regulatory compliance an area that involved increased interaction with attorneys, and that piqued uh, actually Martha's interest in attending law school. So in the summer of 1980, Martha moved to Washington, D.C., where she worked for DuPont as a lobbyist by day, and then attended Georgetown Law in the evening. After receiving her law degree, Martha worked on a broad range of assignments in the DuPont legal department, and in 1998, she was appointed Associate General Counsel and Chief Environmental Counsel before ultimately becoming the Vice President and Assistant General Counsel of DuPont Legal in 2006. So as that capacity, Martha's responsibilities included international managerial responsibilities for DuPont's law departments outside the U.S. And in addition to commercial, environmental, real estate, corporate and securities and mergers acquisitions, practices for the worldwide function. She also served as the Chief Antitrust Counsel for DuPont. So Martha retired in 2015 and remains very active at Purdue as a member of the Board and Executive Committee of the Purdue Alumni Association. She also served on the Civil Engineering Advisory Council and Martha received the Civil Engineering Alumni Achievement Award in 2003 and the Distinguished Engineering Alumni Award in 2009. And she's also a chapter honor member of Chi Epsilon. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's my great honor to welcome a true friend of our school, uh, Martha Reese. Um, good afternoon to everyone, and I want to thank each of you uh, for joining me uh, this afternoon. And I particularly want to uh, thank GS and Don for inviting me. Uh, to come uh, speak with you this afternoon. I always love coming to civil engineering uh, whenever I'm on campus, uh, and especially when I get the opportunity to, to interact uh, with some of the current students. So, so thank you very, very much. <clears throat> I also want to begin by saying um, thank you and congratulations to the students here. Um, first, I want to thank you for choosing civil engineering. Um, my, my two kids who are grown and did not major in civil engineering, are pretty sick of hearing me talk about how civil engineering is, is the foundation of the quality of life that we have today. And I've talked to them for years about being grateful every morning for that fresh, clean, hot water that's coming through uh, in the shower and, you know, the wastewater in our house just magically disappears. We don't have to worry about it. The infrastructure that brings the electricity and the fuels into our house, the infrastructure that supports all of our uh, daily transportation needs. So um, the next generation of civil engineers is needed as much as ever. So thank you uh, for uh, coming to uh, Purdue Civil Engineering uh, to become part of that next generation. And I'm really, really thrilled that Purdue has such a strong uh, program that's uh, contributing, uh, again, to the next training the next generation of, of civil engineers, so thank you. <clears throat> I also wanted to congratulate you for making a choice um, at, at this point in your lives that's going to give you more choices. You know, starting with choosing civil engineering, because when you look at the breadth of the focus areas that you have here in, in civil, it's really quite broad. And once you have your Purdue Civil Engineering degree, 
you're going to, it's going to open up an even broader range of choices as, as you decide you know, what you want your career to be um, going forward. Um, you heard from Nadia a bit about um, my background and my career at DuPont. I spent the whole, my whole career at DuPont, uh, about 41 years, and given my experience as a civil engineer there, as well as a lawyer, the suggestion was made that maybe I could talk about where civil engineering uh, and the law uh, intersects. So I'd like to start by sharing my experience with the law and with lawyers when I was a practicing engineer, and then also discuss some additional legal issues that you may come across um, in your career. So please feel free to interrupt me with any questions uh, as I go on, and also we've got some time at the end and certainly uh, during the reception. So as you heard, my first job with DuPont was as an engineer in our R&D division. Um, many environmental engineers at DuPont were in our engineering division, and they worked on the, the design and construction of uh, environmental control projects. I was in one of our um, businesses, um, and this was in 1973, which was shortly after the formation of the Environmental Protection Agency. Um, the U.S. Congress had uh, adopted many of the uh, seminal statutes, Clean Water Act, Clean Air Act, Nash, uh, NEPA. Um, and so DuPont had several things they had to focus on. Certainly, you know, how were they going to bring their plants into compliance? But they also saw it as a business opportunity, perhaps, in this growing area of an environmental management, environmental control. And that's what I was focused on. In my lab, I had a little bench scale activated sludge plant uh, down the semi works. Um, I had about a 17 high foot, uh, foot high uh, trickling filter. And what I did was to look for what were some problems that the DuPont uh, products could, uh, could help with. And one of the products that DuPont made at the time was hydrogen peroxide, which on the one hand is a very expensive source of oxygen. But on the other hand, it's very effective in targeting certain uh, problem issues. And the one thing that I looked at was <clears throat> um, in, the, in the bench scale uh, activated sludge unit, if it went aerobic and the sludge blanket floated, uh, I found out if you added uh, hydrogen peroxide, you could flip it back to in an aerobic state, and it was a relatively quick, although expensive, fix. Um, likewise, another area where hydrogen peroxide turned out to be pretty valuable was in low-lying, flat, uh, warm areas like Fort Lauderdale, where the as the sewage kind of meandered down the down the sewage pipes, the, the uh, aroma wasn't exactly what the Chamber of Commerce um, wanted uh, for the tourists. So there were some opportunities there. And so part of my job was to uh, stay in contact with a patent lawyer that I worked with to see if there was anything that we uh, came up with that uh, we could patent. And um, very unfortunately, we never did uh, identify anything that DuPont could patent, although what, what we came up with in the lab was the basis for a very successful business for a while. The problem is without a patent, pretty soon uh, other competitors uh, could, could come in. Um, after working in R&D, uh, I got moved to our operations division. Again, this was in the 1970s, and the US EPA was um, <coughs> drafting and proposing the enabling regulations that were required under these relatively new uh, environmental statutes. Um, and, you know, these proposals, as you can imagine, were hundreds of pages long. Um, so part of my role in, in operations, I kind of, kind of acted as a bridge between the environmental lawyers in our legal department and about 15 to 20 plant sites that I had responsibilities for to reach out to them, work with them to understand with this given set of proposals, how's that, what's the impact going to be on the sites, um, 
and what are some of the practical problems with the proposals as written, etc. Pull those together and feed that back into the law into the lawyers, kind of the technical comments, the lawyers would layer on uh, the legal comments back into the EPA. And then fast forward when the final regs came out, I kind of had a reverse job, which was to, to reach out uh, to the plants uh, I had responsibility for and make sure they understood what exactly it was they were going to have to do to comply. And also work with them because we had to negotiate all the initial um, wastewater discharge permits as well as the uh, air emission permits. So quite a different job uh, as an environmental engineer than my first job um, in R&D, but nevertheless my, my training and experience uh, as an environmental engineer was, was very important. Um, in that job I probably worked with the lawyers just about every day. And that's where I first got, got a lot of exposure to what is it that uh, lawyers do, um, particularly in-house lawyers at DuPont. Growing up, I, I don't remember ever <laughs> knowing uh, a lawyer. My father was a civil engineer, which had a lot to do why I ended up majoring in civil engineering, but I didn't really know any lawyers. And it seemed like a very, very interesting area, and I decided to, to pivot to go to law school uh, at night. And during the day, I was a uh, government affairs representative, also known as a registered lobbyist, but my focus was on, again, the environmental statutes. Uh, so again, the, my, my history and experience was very important um, and it gave me some, some credibility as I was talking to the congressional and committee staffs on the Hill as they were looking at you know, various changes and amendments uh, to the statutes. Um, so, as I said, I, I did go back to law school. I, I went um, and I went in the evenings uh, while working uh, full-time during the day. Um, and I guess I want to be clear that I'm not really here today to pitch uh, going to law school um, for engineers, although it's certainly an example of, of one of the opportunities uh, that's available uh, with a Purdue civil engineering degree. But, but I think what I did want to emphasize uh, this afternoon is that whatever you end up doing in your career, uh, you will, at one point or another, need to deal with legal issues and you'll need to deal with lawyers. And so I wanted to just touch on um, a couple of the legal issues that you're likely to have to deal with and also maybe make some suggestions as to the best way to uh, work with lawyers. So on day one of your career, um, you'll probably sign a contract. <laughs> um, could be an employment contract, although if you don't have an employment contract, uh, you will be signing an employee confidentiality uh, agreement. And that's going to include some provisions that all the technical ideas you come up with belong to your employer, <laughs> including ideas that you come up with, you know, off the job. Um, read and understand this document carefully um, because what's in it may become an issue for you if you want to change jobs in the future, for example, and go work for a competitor. So um, always read uh, what you're signing. Um, of course, you're going to deal with a lot of other contracts in the course of of your career, um, wherever you work, um, things like construction contracts or financing contracts, um, procurement contracts, facilities management contracts, intellectual property licenses, joint venture contracts, uh, employment contracts, and on and on and on. Um, what I want to focus on is sort of the practical value of these contracts and not so much the the legal niceties uh, of the contract, you know, whether you have offer and acceptance and uh, consideration. Your contract negotiations that you may be involved in are often oral, either face-to-face -face or uh, over the phone. Um, and then, and usually there won't be a lawyer 
uh, as part of those discussions, and nor should there be. Um, you don't need the lawyers involved in, <laughs> involved in everything. Uh, most contracts, you know, 95 percent of what you're dealing with, you, you don't really need to have a lawyer in the discussion. But often you'll want to have the lawyer reduce it uh, to writing and create a draft. Um, and maybe the most important point I want to make about these contracts and these drafts is that these documents are your documents. They're not the lawyer's documents. Um, this is an issue I had with my clients for, for 30 years. You know, they strike the deal and they say, okay, Martha, here's, here's the terms, you know, put in a document and they want to run off to their next deal. But, but the contract really belongs to the client and it's an important part of, of your business. And there's a couple of, a couple of critical aspects of it. Um, number one, when you put things in writing, um, and read it, um, it'll help you see if it all fits together from all the aspects of, of the deal you negotiate uh, hang together. Um, when you show the draft to the other side, um, sometimes I'll look at that and say, no, that's, that's not what I said, that's not what I agreed to. And when things are oral, you can, you can hear things differently, you can misremember things. Um, so it's really important to kind of reduce it to writing, and then you've got to read it. <laughs> the lawyer's going to do the best job they can in terms of what they thought they heard from you, but you really need to kind of take a look at it and make sure that's exactly what you want, you meant to agree to. And of course, this is especially important if the other side uh, does the first draft. And I would also re strongly recommend that you always volunteer to do the first draft. <laughs> first mover advantage. Um, and so it's a very powerful tool. Um, the other thing uh, about contracts is they're important as historical documents because particularly agreements that go over uh, a long period of time, months or years, the individuals who are involved in negotiating are likely to have moved on, they got promoted, they go work someplace else, and their successor has to understand what exactly uh, was agreed to. And having this in a document is, is going to be really important because you really can't rely on, on memory. So how best to work with lawyers uh, on these contracts? First of all, bring in the lawyer as soon as you start thinking about the project and, and talk it over because they can give you some uh, input on some of the key issues. Uh, <clears throat> one of the key roles of any lawyer is um, identifying risk and helping you think through, okay, how do we mitigate this risk? You can't eliminate all risk. I mean, if that's your goal, you might as well not get out of bed in the morning. Um, that's just not, but I think I always said the goal should be, should be to at least eliminate stupid risks. And I think the, the lawyers can really help you with that because they've usually worked on a lot of other projects where they've seen things go wrong <laughs> or go badly and hopefully will bring uh, that experience and learning uh, to your uh, project. Also, in terms of risk, where well, the lawyer will help you think through where should the, how should the risks be allocated. And of course, you'll want to put all the risk on the other party, but that usually doesn't hold. And so to really think through how, how do you balance these risks. Um, it helps to keep the lawyer in the loop as you're going through the negotiation because um, they're just going to be able to more quickly come up with the, the draft when you ask them to do so. And then, I'll repeat, read the draft. <laughs> when um, they come up with the draft, please read, read the draft. And then after the contract is executed, make sure you set up a process for the implementation of the, of the contract. That everyone in your organization that has a role in implementation understands what it is and, and you put this in place. And then at the same time, set up some kind of process so you can kind of monitor the contract as it goes along, making sure that the other party is doing what, what they're supposed to do, um, and keeping track of the timelines, the termination dates, the expiration dates of, of the contract. Because um, many of these contracts will say that the term is five years, but it'll be automatically renewed. 
uh, if you don't give one year notice that you that you don't want to renew it. So just set up a, a good process and, and and pay attention to these contracts. So be a great tool and provide some great discipline, operating discipline uh, for your organization. Um, second area uh, that you're apt to run into, uh, well, you will run into is regulatory uh, law. You know, as we all know, there's just regulations everywhere. And every day you're going to be dealing with, with some kind of regulation. I guess one initial question will be, you know, does the project require uh, a PE license? <laughs> um, and I don't know if the GS, if the seniors still have the opportunity to uh, take the fundamentals of engineering exam before they leave. I can't emphasize enough, just do it. Take that exam before you leave <laughs> Purdue. When I was here, the, the professors kind of almost implied that you couldn't get your uh, degree if you hadn't taken <laughs> and, and that was a great thing, because I saw my father, who waited till 16 years after he graduated, just to take the fundamentals of engineering, and he just really, he really struggled with it. So just take it, <laughs> get it, get it over with, um, and then you, and then you've got it, and then you can decide uh, after you've got your uh, years of practice in whether you want to uh, take the next step, which I would also uh, recommend. It, it turned out that I ended up taking my PE exam within months that I took the LSATs. Um, and, well, for one thing, I didn't know if I could get into law school, so I didn't want to let the opportunity pass um, uh, to take my PE. And then it kind of ended up being somewhat useful to me, uh, even uh, as a lawyer. Um, many of my clients inside DuPont were engineers, and so when I got my certificate, I framed it, put it on my office wall, so when they come in, they see that I was a, a professional engineer. And then um, from time to time, DuPont manufactures and sells a lot of products, but like most companies also got into the services business. And every once in a while they come up with an idea that involved providing engineering services of one type or another, and it just really helped me to kind of have in the back of my mind, well, we got to first check out, you know, what sort of uh, registration registrations are we going to need. So it wasn't a total waste of time. Um, but, you know, obviously the, the list of regulations um, that you'll encounter um, goes on and on and on from zoning uh, to uh, eminent domain, water rights, uh, OSHA regulations that apply uh, while you're implementing a project. OSHA regulations are going to apply to the project uh, as a, in its finished form, um, environmental regulations, employee regulations, on and on and on. And depending on the job you have, you may actually end up being more of an expert in certain categories of regulations than, than even the lawyers. And, and that's fine. I mean, for example, at DuPont, uh, as the Clean Air Act got more and more complicated, and the Title V permits would be, <laughs> you know, inches thick. It was it was the environmental engineers at our plant sites who were the deep experts in what was in those permits, what the requirements were for the permits, um, and so it may well be that as an engineer you will develop this deep deep regulatory expertise. Martha, but, I have a question. Yes. We're talking about regulations, and we environmental engineers get involved in it quite often. And in this day and age, we can communicate the in microseconds with the regulatory agency via texting yes. and uh, email and other things in addition to uh, picking up the phone and talking to them. And so my question goes to the a cautionary uh, consideration here. When you do that and when you're talking with the regulatory agency about a, a hot topic, let me, see, let me say, uh, to set this question up, would it be advisable to do it audibly or do it via email or, in other words, consider not doing it where it's a permanent record? Well, of course, as a lawyer, my answer has to be it depends, right? <laughs> um, but it's a great, 
It's a great question, and you've anticipated uh, something that I wanted to emphasize uh, as part of our discussion. And it, it goes beyond the example um, that you've given, and it's, it's really thinking six times about the documents that you create uh, uh, while, you, while you're on the job. Um, and think broadly about what is a document. I mean, it's not just, it's obviously not a piece of paper, it's not just an email, it's everything. It's texts, it's tweets, it's anything. Um, and nothing ever really disappears anymore. It, there's, there's a whole industry about, of forensics that can uh, recreate uh, anything that, that you've created in the past. So you do need to be thoughtful. Um, and I guess my, my general recommendation would be you know, stick to the facts and stick to the minimum essential in terms of documentation. So what I meant by it depends is often it's important to talk about things, discuss them, uh, particularly if you want to kick around hypotheticals. Don't do that. Um, on email. Do you do audibly versus in a text or in an yes. email? Yes, yes, to, to start with. On the other hand, coming back to what I was saying about contracts, there's some, there's, there are some times when you want to put down for the record, to be kept as a record, facts, positions, etc. But it's the editorializing that tends to be the problem. Uh, the venting. So if you're frustrated and you want to vent, pick up the phone <laughs> and, and vent uh, on the phone. Um, the, other, the other issue is it's really difficult to s keep separate work and personal. Um, and I'm not sure how you do that today. I had separate email accounts personal email account and my work email account and I didn't use my personal email account on my work computer um, because when you get to litigation, uh, which I'll talk, touch on also this afternoon, is um, a lot of it is around document production. They come in, they do a sweep of all your devices and they'll just capture everything that's on all your devices. So it's <laughs> it includes your personal stuff. Uh, as well as uh, your business stuff. And so you can't be venting to a friend, maybe that you don't work with, um, about uh, something, uh, because that will get swept up uh, into the, these document uh, productions. So you do really, really need to think about um, what you put down. You know, having said that, you can't operate any business, you can't operate uh, this school without documents. So you can't do everything um, orally. But you know, if people would just think and read a couple times before they hit send, um, that would certainly uh, solve a lot of, a lot of problems. Um, so that's uh, an excellent question. Um, but also, uh, in addition to it depends, um, that would be something to talk about with, with your lawyer too. And so even on the, as I was saying, on the regulatory issues, um, before you can become an expert in some of these issues, you need to know what they are, what the relevant issues are uh, for your job. So as you start uh, any new job, reach out to the lawyer that's assigned to work with you and get some input on what are the what are the legal issues that you need to be aware of. Not for you to be an, a legal expert, but just issue spotting. So, so you know when to uh, uh, answer, uh, ask the question. So Bob's questions about documents, I guess, uh, lead me to my third area uh, of law. Um, which I'll touch on today, and that's tort law. 
And this is one where I hope you never intersect uh, with tort law because usually uh, litigation is involved if, if that's the case. Uh, because tort law arises when things go wrong. <laughs> There's usually a damage to somebody, either to their person, to their property, to their business, to their reputation. Um, and the remedy for that is you know, a lawsuit seeking some kind of monetary uh, compensation. And the litigation that civils are involved in um, it usually falls into one of four categories. Um, one is misrepresentation, uh, which is like a false statement with an intent to deceive. This often comes up in uh, contract litigation. Um, there's nuisance. That's uh, the disturbance of a person so that you know, using their property is uh, physically uncomfortable. Uh, lawyers describe that, that in your property you have the, the right to quiet uh, enjoyment. Um, so if you've got some noisy construction project going on next door, you might not be having quiet enjoyment of your property and can give rise for nuisance claims. Negligence is probably the most common, which is basically failure to um, exercise proper care and provide the expertise in accordance with the standards of the profession. And so you can kind of imagine the legal battles over what are the standards for a given project uh, or a given issue that's given rise to the litigation. Uh, and then the last one is product liability where you seek to recover damages for a product that's either defective uh, in the manufacturer or the design, and that's a situation where, uh, as a civil engineer, you're, you're likely to be a plaintiff um, as, as being a defendant. So those are kind of the four, um, the four areas. So when litigation comes up, the lawyers are going to be more front and center. Um, in the litigation, uh, they'll drive the strategy and the execution, but you can't just walk away and have the lawyers uh, handle uh, the litigation. You're going to have to provide a lot of the facts. You're talking about documents, you're going to have to provide um, a lot of the uh, a lot of the documents. It's a part of this. And again, here it's important to remember that litigation is not just a legal issue. It's always, always a business issue, and you own the litigation, uh, and you're just going to need to be, uh, continue to be involved, the, because the outcome of the litigation can affect a lot of things. Often it can be a, a customer or a client suing you, <laughs> so you need to think about your business strategy on how you handle not only with this client, but what are other, other clients going to think. So it's not just... Uh, just a legal issue. It, it really is a, a business issue. Um, and there's a lot of other areas of the law that you may run across, like bankruptcy, I hope not, uh, or securities uh, regulation, but I didn't want to get into all of those today. I, my main purpose was just to uh, hopefully make clear that one way or another, uh, as a civil engineer, you will run into uh, one type of, of uh, legal issue or another over the course of, of your careers. Um, so as you begin any job throughout your whole career, um, reach out to the lawyer, um, to have them help you understand you know, what are some of the legal issues you need to keep an eye on. And you should expect and I would say insist that the um, lawyer be a valuable member of your team in terms of risk mitigation and risk management. And if instead you find that your lawyer wants to be the director of sales prevention, then you need to find a new lawyer. So uh, thanks again for joining me, and I'm happy to answer any questions about civil engineering, going to law school, working for a corporation, so thank you very much.